All right, hey everybody. All right, uh, let's see. Okay, great. That's how that's how that works. Well, thank you, everybody. I really appreciate it. This has been a really special day, uh, getting to meet all of you, and of course to uh, bring the community together that we really have blossoming here. Uh, as was mentioned, I'm the executive director of Ideas for Us. I have been involved in this wonderful organization for the last seven years, and really jumped in at a time when it was emerging as a club uh, here at the University of Central Florida. Chris Castro, who we heard from before, was uh, the founder of the club, and the, the unique aspect of it was that instead of environmental advocacy, this club focused on environmental action, which I think is something that is tremendously important. After all, I think that uh, largely environmental education has been rather broken for the last 30 or 40 years. If you look at a graph of how many people, oh, there's many people coming in right now. If you look at a graph of how much money is spent on environmental education from the 1970s on, you see that it's consistently gone up and up and up, especially for public schools. However, the environmental problems that we're facing are headed in the, uh, in the opposite direction. Well, why? Well, this usually has to do with the fact that it stops at the first uh, of these three areas here. So instead of focusing on educating the person on what they need to do and then bringing them through to a point of empowerment, usually the education part stops there. Uh, this is a tragedy. What it winds up doing, especially after a number of generations, is it leads to people who feel as though the problems are too big for them to do anything against them. How on earth could they uh, mobilize in their community and make any difference, and they wind up becoming apathetic or, or worse, uh, depressed and tuned out to the situation. So this is the last thing that we want, and as a way of trying to fix that, we have ideas for us. I wanted to start off with this. Originally, it was going to be my punchline uh, of this little presentation to you all, but I think that a value set is something that is left out too often when we look at how to go about solving complex sustainability problems that are global at a hyper-local level. And these are four things that have really bubbled to the top that I think are part of our secret sauce of who we are as ideas for us and really puts our heart and character behind us. Inclusion is tremendously important. In a nutshell, it means that every group that we help, whether they're a group of college students at a campus or in a village in rural sub-Saharan Africa, it is them that we involve in being trained to solve their own problems. We are not going there and doing it for them. We are providing them the development, the funding, and the scaling techniques for them to become active in their own communities and do the work themselves. Tremendously important. Resilience, well, if you're in an accident and everyone says, he's all right, he's stable, that's not really that good. You know, sustainability is about getting to a point of resilience where we're not just able to just barely hang on, but, you know, especially if you look at natural disasters and things like that, the cities and the economies that get through them the best are resilient. And of course, we know sustainability has a tremendous uh, role to play in there. So focusing on resilience. Mutualism, I think that organi organizations that behave more like organisms are of course uh, going to be more successful. You have uh, of course the natural selection variables of just navigating the world and being resilient and adaptive to those kinds of things is important. But instead of competing, which is something that we have happen too often between the uh, environmental organizations out there, we really believe in mu mutualism. And it's really been since day one that anyone that wants to partner with us or share resources when we come into a new campus or a new country, we're there to do that instead of competing. Very important. And of course, positivity. I think that there's more than enough doom and gloom out there about the environment. It makes people get turned off to being part of the solution. So having an optimistic, positive approach that focuses on solutions, tremendously important. So what has happened across the last 10 years now of Ideas for Us being an organization? Well, from this campus, we have spread through a grassroots network to have a global footprint where we've done work now in over 30 different countries uh, around the world. Again, this isn't us getting on planes and flying there, though in some cases we do that uh, in order to train groups. But we're in the 21st century. So much of this is accomplishable through the smartphones that are right in your pocket that 
as a speaker said before, would be considered magic today. And uh, I'm happy to say that we think of ourselves as uh, definitely proponents of using Facebook for something that is positive, but so much of our organizing has been through social media. And I think that th that is what separates this environmental movement from the one of the past, especially uh, in the 1960s and 1970s, is that we have this uh, element of global uh, connect uh, connectivity that is so important. Well, many of you have already seen this. I've even been pleased to see some sustainable development goal buttons uh, around today or lapel pins. But of course, sustainability each day, I think, is entering more into the public lexicon as being something that is more than just tree hugging and solar panels. And as a biologist, of course, I love trees and I love renewable energy, but it's also about families having enough food to eat and being able to plan for a future because you know one is going to be there. It's about gender equality and also technological innovations that really drive and change economy. So if you're not familiar with the 17 Sustainable Development Goals and how they apply to sustainability, please take a look at that. But of course, when you unpack this puzzle, you see that it's really a multitude of sectors of varying society. And some of the questions I've been asked today have been, what advice do we have for young people who are wanting to get into this world of sustainability, especially students? And I'd say the first thing to do is whatever you're interested in, realize that that is a part of sustainability. I don't care if you're an engineer or a banker or or a juggler, right? There is a role for you in sustainability, and it's important to see those different kinds of horizons, especially in the public, private, and, uh, and, and independent sectors. So there's many things that I think strike at the heart of what people can choose. Of course, sustainability starts within, like most major world-changing cha decisions. You have to make that decision inside of yourself and move out from there. And there's some low-hanging fruit that are great to talk to people about that I think uh, are familiar to all of us. One certainly is food choice, and there's no surprise there that our industrial agricultural system is a contributor of about a third of climate emissions. Well, you can really make a, a great impact in those kinds of things especially with urban agriculture. And I'm happy to say that we have a, f a program that we've created that's turned into an enterprise. It's called Fleet Farming, and we have gardens uh, even on this campus that we're producing today. So you can see some scenes here, and essentially what it is is reinventing sharecropping, turning lawns and uh, community gardens into producers uh, of, of hyper-local organic food. But it's especially that front lawn uh, aspect that is just really trendy. I think uh, most people inherit a lawn. They don't necessarily want to have one, especially in the, in the face of being able to do lots of these kinds of uh, things. And this is just a, a would-be a patch of grass that's now been converted uh, and, of course, has many different different environmental impacts. I think alternative transportation, especially in understanding the 21st century city and what we're going to grow into in the United States is very, very important. And there's so many different moving parts, especially from the tech sector, that we've been uh, uh, working with many different uh, technical groups and companies for app creation and those kinds of things that can have uh, a really big um, impact. Single-use plastic, of course. I'm happy to see uh, glasses and reusable bottles and things like that here today. So uh, shout out to, to everybody who was involved in that. But I think, uh, especially when you look at the trendiness of things like banning straws that are occurring right now, it's important that the dialogue always goes into it's not just about straws, it's not just about that water bottle, it's more so about the consideration of the impact that the one person has and how that can be applied to so many other things in your life, sustainability or otherwise. So, of course, we know that there's uh, smart decisions that can be made as far as alternates, uh, and starting at the individual level is tremendously important and building from there. So, you know, it's no coincidence that ideas for us as an organization and many of our partners who are in this room have thrived in the city of Orlando. And it's, as uh, was mentioned before, it really has to do with the fact that we have an agreeable local government here. And even when the federal and state government is far from agreeable on climate issues, it's the localism aspect that matters. So this is Grassroots 101. It, you, most of your changes aren't always top down. Fundamentally in culture, it's very much so bottom up. And we're happy to be contributors for uh, the Greenworks plan and all of the varying things that uh, it is doing. 
But what does this really look like? Well, back to those four aspects of value set that I wanted to bring into play. Sustainability also has a tremendous aspect for community. I think that there are so many people out there who are longing for something to do and to get involved in, to have an idea that they have and to be in a place where it can become nurtured and become a actual project that can then transform into perhaps an enterprise, a uh, business in and of itself, uh, or a solution that keeps on giving more and more into the world. So I don't think that this is isolated to any one generation either. And that's why we focus as a grassroots organization on intergenerational, interdisciplinary cooperation. And there aren't a lot of places like this. This scene is from a program that we do called The Hive. And uh, one of the most wonderful things about it is that we often have people from uh, boomers all the way through to Gen Z cooperating on sustainability issues and creating action projects right there. This was a video that I was going to play, but I've been told I'm a little strapped for time, so uh, I will make sure that this is uh, available in, uh, in, in email, and it certainly is on our website, ideasforus.org, if you're interested. Um, so we'll continue on. But in a nutshell, here's our process. We bring people together, and we want to focus on developing their idea into a project. So we use human-centered design. We take a look at all of the different moving parts in it in a collaborative, safe setting for people and uh, brainstorm on that. But of course, it's not just about educating people on that idea and the steps they can take. It's the actual action part. And that requires uh, an important uh, aspect, and that's funding. And uh, we like to say that in order to have a, uh, an, an outcome, you have to have an income. Uh, and it's very much so true, uh, not just for the private sector, but also the public sector, so, uh, and independent sector as well. So it's, uh, it's a very important aspect to rem remember that it doesn't take a tremendous amount of funding to make a impactful change. Two or three hundred dollars can make the difference between a group of students creating an aquaponic system to grow vegetables on their dorm room balcony and not doing something like that. Small projects can change people's lives and uh, making sure that people have access to them is tremendously important. And the best part is, is that as you're building these kinds of communities and networks between people, you can share these kinds of ideas as solutions across that network and they continue to go on and give uh, in many different ways. So uh, that's uh, what I wanted to share uh, initially. And I think that, again, back to that slide of our values, as the world is changing in the 21st century, it's very, very important that we lead with a mindset that we have to cooperate our way through this. Uh, the last thing that we want to see as we're leading up to this daunting 2030 deadline is to have governments and to have countries and to have environmental organizations and funders warring at one another for a piece of the pie. So for all of you that are here today, please come see me, email me, check out ideas for us. Our resources are there to be able to help you. We're there to make connections. We happen to be the only uh, uh, 501c3 nonprofit that's part of the United Nations in Central Florida, and those kinds of access uh, is, is very important for uh, understanding how sustainability initiatives transform through, uh, through the, the scale. I'd also like to just recognize real quick, uh, we have uh, Francois, if you wouldn't mind just standing up and, and wave. Francois here is a fellow from uh, the US Department of State IREX program. This is his first time in the United States. He's visiting ideas for us for four months, and uh, I brought him today as my guest. So uh, thank you for being here, Francois. We're, we're very happy to have you. And his role will be learning about uh, things that Ideas for Us does across these four months and being able to bring them back to his home country and, uh, and organize uh, in Guinea, as well as build relationships with all of you. So I was told if I blast through that quick, I could answer some questions uh, to the audience. I, I think I did. They haven't pulled out the shepherd's crook to pull me off yet, so, uh, so we'll see. Two minutes. Cool. Th thank you. Questions? Anybody? Yes, sir. Yeah, it, it has. Actually, uh, it's one of our programs that went viral in 2016. We had like a thousand communities reach out to us. We made a map once that had all of these pins on it from where inquiries came in after we were on NBC Nightly News, and uh, it really caught on. The problem is, is that 
many places have their own ordinances about growing food in your lawn. Luckily, here in Orange County, you can have 60% of your front lawn be edible landscaping and unlimited sides and back lawn. Uh, that's really wonderful, but not every place, of course, has that luxury. Um, we're always looking for partners and communities to be able to handle something like that. Um, we've so far done some test uh, uh, farms in Jacksonville and in Oakland, California, but we're really concentrating on Orlando right now and opening a, a fleet farming branch in Paramore uh, last year uh, as a way of growing food hyper-locally to combat food deserts uh, for one of Orlando's uh, most challenged communities with lots of various food issues. So re-teaching re farming has been tremendously important there. Okay, cool. All right. Thank you so much.